My name is Devin Smith, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the final session of our summer online learning series hosted by Continuing and Professional Education, or CAPE for short, here at the University of St. Thomas. So thank you for joining us this morning. You know, our goal with these sessions is really to complement your morning cup of coffee or your morning commute with some really practical learning. It's going to impact how you work today and in the days ahead. And we're really looking forward to today's session. Today's session is titled Jim Collins, 40 Years in 40 Minutes. And we're excited to hear from St. Thomas adjunct faculty member Blake Darso as he reflects on key lessons from popular business author Jim Collins, a name that many of you are probably familiar with already, but that others will become very well acquainted with through this crash course. Um, I'm gonna introduce Blake in just a minute, but I do have a few reminders I wanted to say at the, at the outset today. Today is the conclusion of our summer online learning series, but once again, we will be launching a fall online learning series as well. We're planning to deliver about three sessions, one in October, November, and then December, kind of taking a break for the month of September. So October, November, December, and once those specifics are finalized, we're going to send that information to you at the email address that you used to register for today's session. So you won't miss that information. For today's session, we've reserved some time at the end for Q&A like we often do but Blake also let me know that he's open to uh, accepting questions throughout the presentation that are relevant to what he's talking about. So please send in any questions that you have through the Zoom chat feature, and you can address those questions to all panelists. Don't send them to Blake directly. Don't send them to Devin directly. Send them to all panelists, and that way my team and I can do our best behind the scenes here to sort the emergent questions and then filter the ones that should be asked at the end of the session. So as always, it's our goal. We're going to end this session at 8.55 a.m. Central Time so that you have time to get to your next engagement today. And if you have any technical difficulties at all, just remember that the session is being recorded and you're going to receive a link to the video just a couple of business days from now. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Blake Darso. Blake is a financial professional currently serving as the chief financial officer at Midwest Radiology, a large private physician practice in the Twin Cities. Blake has a passion for comp making complex accounting and finance concepts much easier to understand, and he has the chance to do that as an adjunct faculty member at the University of St. Thomas, both in the classrooms and uh, in venues just like this, too. Blake earned his bachelor's in accounting and political science from the University of Minnesota Duluth and his MBA from the University of St. Thomas. Go Tommies! Uh, he is also a licensed CPA here in the state of Minnesota. Blake has expertise in the healthcare industry, previously serving as the CFO at the largest federally qualified health center in Minnesota and in the healthcare group of a large professional services firm as well. And in addition to this expertise, Blake is a huge Jim Collins fan. He's got all the books um, and he's applied many of the key lessons to his own professional career. So we're very excited to have Blake sharing those lessons with us today. So Blake, the floor is yours. Great, great. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Devin. And thank you to everyone uh, joining us this morning on the Zoom call, um, I'm, I'm really excited to share this work. I've done quite a bit of, of research going into this presentation, um, and I'm just a, I'm a big Jim Collins fan. I consider him to be one of the greatest business thinkers of all time. Uh, so, without further ado, we got a lot of ground to cover. Forty years and forty minutes. So, we are uh, going to get at it here. So, in terms of this morning's agenda. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit about Jim Collins. Who is Jim Collins? Uh, many of you may already know him. Uh, I might be familiar for, with his work. If you're not familiar with his work, uh, I'd encourage you to go check it out. Uh, the idea for this topic, this online learning series topic, really stemmed from me picking up a copy of BE 2.0 or Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. Uh, Jim published that in 2000, or 2020. So very, very recently, and it was largely overlooked probably uh, during the COVID period. I didn't even know it was being published and I'm a, I'm a huge Jim Collins fan. But what, uh, what that book did, I believe for the first time is consolidate all of Jim's research-based principles on what makes great organizations perform at a high level and sustain that high level of performance for a long period of time. He published that 
in a single consolidated roadmap or map. Uh, and that's what we're gonna dive into this morning. There's 12 underlying principles. If you go uh, back to, to Built to Last, his first book from 1994 forward, it's got 12 consolidated principles in a particular order that we're gonna look at. Uh, BE 2.0 also included uh, Jim's views from, from 2020. So a lot of additional insights and in, in narrative from that. And, and as Devin mentioned, we're gonna leave some time for questions here. So who is Jim Collins? Jim Collins is um, a polymath, a genius in my opinion. Um, he graduated uh, from Stanford University in 1980 with a, a math degree. And I think it's that, that math background that really influences the way that he approaches research. He is very, very, very rigorous in, in the way he researches. He used match pair comparison companies. So take one company and compare it to another company in the same industry at the same time. And he does that for long periods of time. And the wisdom that, that, that comes from that is, is truly remarkable. Um, I'd encourage all of you to check out jimcollins.com. There's a ton of free information. You know, just all of, all of the information that we're going through today, um, you can find additional writings and articles published by Jim on his website. And he's really, uh, at the end of the day, he's a student and a teacher himself. He spent uh, quite a bit of time at Stanford um, winning the Distinguished Teaching Award. In, in when he approaches his consulting work, he does do consulting work. He does it in a Socratic method. He asks a lot of questions. He doesn't provide a lot of answers. People come to their own conclusions about their own companies. He really forces them and challenges them to think hard. So that is Jim's background in the beginning half of his life there, the Stanford years. He, he happens to be married to someone who I believe is as intense as he is. Uh, Jim Collins is an incredibly intense person. Uh, when you listen to him speak, you listen to his audio clips, you listen to his interviews, he's, he's a very intense man. Uh, behind that uh, is his wife, Joanne, um, who won the 1985 Ironman um, and chairs his personal board of directors. So uh, she, she deserves a lot of credit for his success there. Um, Jim left the comfort of Stanford in 1995. So he describes it as his Thelma and Louise moment with Joanne, where they left California. He opened his, his management lab in Boulder um, and really, at that point, started researching Good to Great, which is the book probably most people are familiar with. Um, but you know, between 1995 and, and when Good to Great was published, it was I believe six years. So um, left the comfort of Stanford and moved to Boulder, still lives in Boulder today. He's an avid rock climber, um, has completed single day ascents of El Capitan and Half Dome. I have no idea what that entails, but I, I believe that it involves not sleeping for more than 36 hours a row. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes of Jim Collins. It comes from the Tim Ferriss show. There's two episodes of the Tim Ferriss show that Jim did, uh, both great episodes, more than two hours long. But I think it's a really interesting framing of his research and his work. He's not really a business author per se. He just uses businesses because that's where the data is. Right? There's all these Fortune 500 companies have to publish data quarter after quarter after quarter after year after year after year. Um, and there's a lot of information in there. So really considers himself more of a, a student and a teacher of human systems and what works rather than just pure business. But these uh, principles do apply uh, certainly to business uh, as, as you see in his books and his writing. Two things I'd mention about Jim Collins' portfolio of work right up front. I would encourage you to frame these as kind of installments in a volume of work that are all aimed at uncovering the foundational principles behind great performance. So it's not one book in a silo of another book. They're all related to each other, all aimed at answering why do great companies exist? Why do some um, prevail and others don't? Uh, 
Built to Last was the first book he co-published with uh, Jerry Porras. Uh, that one is famous locally here for having uh, one of the, the quote unquote visionary companies uh, B3M. So 3M is in that book as a kind of iconic company that was built to last by uh, William McKnight. Good to Great, published in 2001, definitely the most famous of, of his publications. Um, I, I believe in the last three weeks, I've re-listened to that audiobook three times. <laughs> uh, it's great, I highly recommend it. It's the number one business book I, I recommend. Um, and then the, the monograph, uh, Good to Great in the Social Sectors, really an extension of Good to Great um, applying a lot of the principles specifically to the social sector. So if you work in a nonprofit, if you run a nonprofit, I'd encourage you to, to pick that monograph up. It's very short and it's very condensed. Um, the second thing I'd mentioned about Jim Collins, he, he just doesn't write fluffy business books. I've read a lot of business books that are um, you know, about the CEO's journey and the great things they did and some trials and tribulations. But uh, Jim Collins reads, writes data-driven books. Um, these are, these are um, incredibly well thought out and structured books. I, I think he's just a, a brilliant writer. Generally. So, uh, continuing on with his publications here, 2009, How the Mighty Fall, um, really getting at the question of you know, why do some companies achieve greatness and then fall? I think uh, recently, you know, I could think of like GE as an example. Like why, why are some of these companies that are great and iconic, when they reach that and then fall. Uh, great book. That, that one's pretty short. It's a quick read. Uh, published in 2011, uh, Great by Choice. That I see as the closest uh, cousin or extension of uh, Good to Great. It's, it's co-authored with Morton Hansen, who was on the Good to Great research team and went on to have, uh, still has a, a really good academic career himself. Um, that one looks at chaos, because think about the time that was published in 2009, when you know, the, the Great Recession and the housing market crash, why, why do some companies thrive in chaos and others don't? And then the Turn the Flywheel published in, in 2019, out of all the principles, the 12 principles that we're gonna take a look at today, the flywheel I think is the one that people have the most uh, trouble with understanding. So I, I think that's why he published the, the monograph specifically. Here are some examples of flywheel concepts. Uh, but we're really here this morning because of this book, BE uh, 2.0. Um, as I mentioned, it, it takes all, all of Jim's wisdom and research and, and consolidates it into a single roadmap. It, and um, it's really uh, a tribute to Bill Lazier too. Um, but Bill Azir was Jim's most important life mentor. Um, the original book they published together while they, they taught together at Stanford. Um, and it extends the legacy of Bill. Um, so one of the biggest questions in life is, you know, who luck? You know, who, who do you have the fortune to uh, get to know? So I think, you know, Bill Lazier um, really laid the foundation for Jim Collins' trajectory, and uh, Jim did a, did a great job of uh, including a single chapter with just lesson lives, or life lessons from Bill, including one that's uh, put butter on your waffles. If you have a chance to pick up the book, I highly encourage you to read that chapter, uh, put butter on your waffles. So about the map. The map shows the underlying principles present. Think about the underlying conditions or principles that are present whenever great performance is achieved and sustained over long periods of time. All of this based on, on, on research. Two things to note um, in terms of the map, do not confuse the inputs and outputs. That is a very frequent occurrence, according to Jim. So, the inputs, the 12 principles, delineate a path to what a great company is, how to get there, think about that. 
outputs define what a great company is, not how to get there. It's the what. Um, second thing, performance is not guaranteed. Yeah. Um, it's really, 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 really highly correlated with the underlying principles, but at the end of the day, you have to make it happen as, as a leader. Um, so you have to start step one, go to step 12, and push through probably decades. I'm over time. I, I would, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal a quote from the Mandalorian here. <clears throat> this is the way, and this is the way, this is the way to greatness. Um, based on the research. So what are the inputs? Stage one, we have two principles. First, people. Always deal with people first. Stage one is disciplined people. Level five leadership is the first principle. Second principle, first who, then what? That one is famous. That one's the most famous, I think, of all the principles because get the right people on the bus and the right seats. Stage two, after you've dealt with people, move on to discipline thought. Embrace the genius of the end, confront the brutal facts, and clarify your hedgehog concept. We'll get to those all in detail because the names are, are not necessarily intuitive with what they mean. Stage three, after you've dealt with disciplined people and your disciplined thought, you go to discipline action. So building the flywheel, the flywheel principle, flywheel concept. 20 mile march and fire bullets, then cannonballs. Those are those three principles in stage three. In the final stage, building it to last, making sure you're building something that's enduring and will sustain beyond your tenure. Four princi three principles there, productive paranoia, clock building, not time telling, and preserve the core and stimulate progress. That's where the, the BHAG concept comes from. If you don't know that, put a pin in there. The 12th principle comes from Great by Choice, a book published in, in 2011. And it's get a high return on luck. And that one is probably the least intuitive principle to uh, understand on its face. But we'll get to that. Uh, the, outputs, the outputs, how do you define what great performance is? Superior results, distinctive impact and lasting endurance. And this is it, this is it. Jim Collins has moved on to studying a different set of questions. So he is not studying great performance in business anymore. Um, he, has, he has moved on. So this is like his, this is his legacy with this topic. He's gonna create a legacy with another topic. Uh, just a, a note on discipline. I, I pulled a quote here from Great by Choice. Um, if you're like me, the, the word discipline can kind of be cringeworthy sometimes. If you, if you associate it with strict obedience to a hierarchy or uh, bureaucratic rules or measurement or some, some sort of you know, top-down version of discipline. But true discipline requires the you know, kind of the independent mind, independent thinking. Uh, he'll, he'll say that the, you know, great leaders, 10X leaders, the only legitimate form of discipline self-discipline, having the inner will to do whatever it takes to create a great outcome, no matter how difficult. Uh, that's discipline, not disciplinarian. Big distinction there. So phase one, discipline people, principle number one, right out of the gate, level five leadership. So what is level five leadership? Level five leadership is building enduring and greatness. Enduring greatness, through a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. I think the two um, don't necessarily go hand in hand. So in, in Good to Great, the book Good to Great, there's a lot of emphasis and focus on the humility aspect. And if you read Great by Choice, there's a lot of emphasis on the, um, the drive, the professional will, the, the, you know, the need to get it done no matter what. Um, at the beginning of Jim's research uh, for Good to Great, he told the team, and this is, this is in Good to Great, uh, but I think he tells it better in, in a couple podcast interviews. He told the team that there will not be a leadership answer. Leadership cannot be an answer because good companies have leadership, 
Bad companies have leadership. Mediocre companies have leadership. Leadership is just the plug figure. Think back to him being a math, uh, a math major. He said, leadership is just a plug figure. Um, and then one day he comes in and the, the team is standing around the table and they're all holding hands. And Jim says, well, what, what's the deal here? Why, why are you all holding hands? Well, something must be up. And he said, they, they all said, Jim, this is the day we tell you that you're wrong. Um, and remember, he's an intense guy. So it takes probably a lot of courage. Jim, you, you're wrong. Leadership does matter. And here's why. And the team explained their findings on leadership. It's not that leadership is or isn't present in any companies. All companies have a form of leadership. It's a different type of leadership that builds and sustains great performance over time. It's personal humility and just a professional drive. Um, charisma is not required. It's found in most of the disastrous cases in, in Jim's research, where some outside savior, very charismatic CEO comes in uh, those generally don't end well. Um, Jim has described uh, level five leaders as slightly neurotic or productively neurotic, or PNFs, uh, productively neurotic freaks or paranoid neurotic freaks. A uh, couple nuggets from BE 2.0 from, from Jim's 2020 extension of uh, BE. What exactly is leadership? So he, you know, having said that leadership's a plug figure, you have to define really concisely what leadership is. And leadership in one sentence, the art of getting people to want to do what must be done. You have to want to do it. If you just tell people what to do, then that's power. And there's this inverse relationship between leadership and power. Good leaders use leadership. Bad leaders use power. Second one, what cause do you serve? And this, this gets at the ambition of level five leaders. Uh, level five leaders are incredibly ambitious, fanatical, obsessed, monomaniacal, relentless, exhausting. But their ambition is first and foremost for the cause, for the company, for the work, not themselves. Level five leaders are not ambitious for their own career, their own paycheck. They're ambitious for the company, for the cause, for the mission. Second principle, very, very, very um, famous principle. First two, then what? Get the right people in the right seats on the bus and then figure out where to drive it. You know, so I have to get the wrong people off the bus. Um, very famous principle, very hard to implement. It, it just takes just sheer will to make sure you have the right people in the right seats without moving forward. It's so tempting to move forward and just go straight to strategy, straight to implementation. Um, Packard's law from David Packard of the Hewlett Packard fame, no company consistently grow. It's no company can consistently grow faster than its ability to get enough of the right people so they can have a great company. So you, you wanna grow without getting enough of the right people? Enough, enough people aligned with your mission and values, that's not gonna happen. The number one metric, according to Jim, that every company should measure, percentage of key seats on the bus that are filled with the right people for those seats. More important than income or important than return on equity, this is upstream of all those financial measures, the right people. People at the end of the day implement strategies. People at the end of the day make things operate efficiently. It's all about people, 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 people. Jim's view from 2020, great vision without great people is irrelevant. This is, a, this is I believe, a whole chapter in BE 2.0. And I just pulled out a little nugget that I find useful because one of the hardest things is determining whether you have the right person in the right seat. So Jim came up with a set of questions. Um, for you to think through. Um, it, it seems like most leaders have some sort of default, you know, or either mainly replace or mainly keep and develop. Um, but, you know, Jim would encourage more of a, a data-driven, analytical-driven approach. One of my favorite quotes with 
with Jim and people. When you're facing chaos, turbulence, disruption, and uncertainty, and you cannot possibly predict what's coming around the corner, your best strategy, quote unquote, is to have a busload of disciplined people who can adapt and perform brilliantly no matter what comes next. It's all about people. That's why you start with people. Principles one and two, people, 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 people. After you have... Hey, no, Blake. Have, <clears throat> one quick question that came out yeah. I thought is kind of interesting on the last yeah. point. Yeah. So how do you know who the right people are if you don't know where you are going? Um, um, so yeah, kind of flipping that around a little bit. If there's no great vision, how do you know to get the right people? Any insights on that or does Jim speak to that at all? Uh, the right people will find, uncover, uncover is the right word. Right people will uncover what the hedgehog concept for a business is. And then they will, in a very disciplined way, operationalize that through the five little concept. So it's not about you know, uncover, it's not about like some leader coming in and saying, oh, here's our purpose and here's where we're going. No, you have to, you have, to have the right people to really get at the foundational core purpose through the hedgehog concept, which we're going to get at, and then have the right people implement it. Um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I like to say no, no wisdom is new wisdom. So I, I think the who principle uh, transcends business and it, it, it gets into life too. It's like, you know, you want to have a great life. You surround yourself with the right who. Um, you want to get things done. You ask the right who. Surround yourself with the right who. Uh, good question. Though. That, that's a question that's come up several times. Um, but if you, if you follow the logic through these right people then engage in disciplined thought and disciplined debate to find the answer on where to go and then implement that where to go together. So you, you collectively find the vision as a team rather than some top-down leader uh, giving you the vision. Great question, great question. Thanks Blake and thanks but, Diane for the question from the audience. Um, so moving on to discipline thought, you have the right people on the right seats in the bus. You have the right leader that assembles the right team. Now we have to go to discipline thought. We have to um, really go on a journey of asking ourselves tough questions. And this principle um, is really about rejecting false dichotomies and embracing the genius of the and. And you don't need creativity or discipline, you need creativity and discipline. You don't need freedom and responsibility. You need, or you need freedom and responsibility. You don't need freedom or responsibility, right? These things that people often frame as either or, you, or you, we can have cost, low cost or high quality, but we can't have both. Well, no, actually you need both. You need low cost and high quality that you need both to survive long-term. Um, this, uh, I'll give a shout out to uh, my St. Thomas professor, Mary Slack, in her leadership course. She really hammered this one home uh, for the class, for myself. This principle shows up a lot in the success cases that um, are in Jim's book. Uh, in this principle also lays the foundation for the, the, the big um, built to last principle, preserve the car and stimulate progress. Um, so we'll get to get to that, the yin and yang principle. Jim's view from 2020, uh, don't confuse the new, or don't confuse rare with new, or the new with the rare. This is really about purpose beyond product, profits. So the story goes that um, Jim noted that we seem to live in a period, again, where people seem to have found purpose again. But we need leadership that tells us why. We need leadership that inspires us. We need leadership that's beyond making money. And Jim's response is, well, yeah, if you look at the research, the great companies always, always embraced purpose and profit. And they, they led with purpose and profit came after. 
right? Purpose is always, always present in the great company. Confront the brutal facts. Um, this is where some of these principles is where you see the intensity of Jim Collins come out. This is an intense one. Confront the brutal facts. So this really involves living the Stockdale paradox. So the Stockdale paradox is uh, named after Admiral Stockdale, who was the highest ranking officer at the Hanoi Hilton in the Vietnam War. Admiral Stockdale spent eight years, eight years in Vietnam, in the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, and the principle that comes from Admiral Stockdale is that you must remain unwavering in your faith that you can and will prevail at the end, regardless of the difficulties, and at the same time, here's the and, and at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Um, this is one of my favorites, not my, not my favorite favorite. We're getting to that. One of my favorites. Quote from Jim, level five leaders confront the brutal facts before they set vision and strategy and then create a climate where the truth can be heard. Truth is heard. Failure to confront the brutal facts is the precursor to catastrophic decline always. So every company that was great, that failed to uh, sustain that greatness, always believe their own press. They never confronted the brutal facts. Ego, ego and whatever else getting in the way. Confront the brutal facts. Second page, how do you demonstrate this principle? Conduct autopsies without blame. You have to be hard on people, not on process. Uh, disciplined thought. I thought this was a really good uh, place to put this, the basic architecture for making a good executive decision. Determine exactly how much time you have, stimulate dialogue and debate, make a firm decision, unify fully, move on. That's just, that's what the good to great companies did in the research. Headshot concept, my personal favorite of all the principles. Um, I am a simple creature. I am, I, thousand times more headshot than Fox. Um, those who built great companies tended to be more headshot than Fox. So what, what is this strange concept? Um, it comes, it stems from a Greek parable and the um, writer Isaiah Berlin wrote an essay called The Hedgehog and the Fox that really describes this in detail if you're interested, but the gist of it is the fox is Embrace complexity, pursue many ideas, never dedicating themselves to a single thing. I, I'd also encourage you to, to Google the sophistication bias. Um, hedgehogs, on the other hand, as opposed to foxes, strive toward simplification and think of think in terms of a grand organizing idea, um, centrally focused, they're very grounded. This is the one thing we do well. <laughs> This is the one thing we're built to do. So visual of the concept is a Venn diagram. So picture a Venn diagram, uh, with three circles that um, intersects at the point of what you are deeply passionate about as a company, what drives your economic engine, and what you could be the best in the world at. The intersection of those three things is the hedgehog concept for your company. So you have disciplined people who are confronting the brutal facts and thinking uh, in a disciplined way, embracing the genius of the end. We're going to come to the conclusion that this is our hedgehog concept, and then we're going to move forward together. Uh, two notes here: uh, social sector organizations, nonprofits. Uh, you replace the economic engine with resource engine because you have time, money, and brand. Um, as your kind of quote unquote resource. And then a personal hedgehog concept, you can apply this concept to yourself. And instead of the best in the world that you have to replace that with what you're genetically encoded to do. I am genetically encoded to, to be an accountant. I think that, that's what my genetic encoding is for. Um, other people have a genetic encoding. Uh, so I, I think one of the, uh, things Jim mentions is beware of the curse of competence. So a lot of people are very smart and they could do a lot of things. Uh, but if you don't take a step back and think about this for yourself personally, 
you're gonna you're gonna continue to do well in things but not be great in one thing. The flywheel concept. Flywheel concept. There's a separate monograph just for the flywheel concept with examples in it. Great. I got two of them in the slide coming up here. Um, this is the hardest one, I think, for people to, to grasp. So uh, good to great transitions don't happen overnight. You have to think about the flywheel as the underlying architecture that advances your hedgehog concept. So we're, we're clear about what we're, we are, what we can be the best in the world at, how we can get paid. How do we operationalize that? What's the architecture behind that? The key word here is momentum. Um, side note, um, it took on average the good to great companies four years to figure out their hedgehog concept, four years figure out their hedgehog concept and to achieve breakthrough with the flywheel, seven years, seven years. It's, um, an incredible amount of time invested in getting the right people and engaging in this one thought to get to this point. Uh, so we're advancing our hedgehog concept, accumulating results, lining up people and building momentum. So that um, I think one of the most underlooked points here is, you know, if you have the right people, they are energized by the results. They are energized by the momentum. If you have to motivate people, uh, you, you don't have the right person. You, you don't have the right person. It's just, I guess. Okay, so what happens if you don't get the right people engaged in disciplined thought, but continue to plow forward anyway? That is the opposite of the flywheel. We are going counterclockwise, and Jim Collins calls that the doom loop, where we start with disappointing results, we have reaction without really understanding, new program, new fad, new leader, new acquisition, new something, change in direction, no momentum, no buildup, no breakthrough, nothing. More disappointing results, more reaction, new thing, no momentum, more disappointing results. Um, I've seen this, I've seen it happen. It is very, very ugly. The flywheel, this one, this one because of um, I, I think it's uh, complexity is best understood by seeing examples. So Amazon came to Jim right after Good to Great was published, <clears throat> Jeff Bezos and, and team, and Jim helped them think through their, their flywheel, which 20 plus years later has, has really paid off, obviously, for Jeff Bezos and Amazon. <clears throat> Start with low prices, increase customer visits more third-party resellers, expand the store, grow revenue for fixed costs, lower prices again, go run the, go run the flywheel, do this a thousand times over, and then take 15 years or whatever uh, amount of time it took for Amazon to post a profit. And now they're, they're literally printing money. Um, so you can thank Jim Collins for part of Amazon's growth. Cleveland Clinic, so a nonprofit example. Cleveland Clinic's a nonprofit. They start with getting the right people, getting the right medical professionals, collaborate, a, cultivate a collaborative patient-centered culture, work across specialties, attract patients from around the world, get more patients from around the world, all over, fuel the resource engine, invest in facilities, research, and people. Do it again, do it again, do it again. So flywheel concept. Disciplined action number one. Discipline principle number two, 20 mile march. So this is about fanatic discipline, another uh, kind of intense descriptor from Jim there. Concrete, intelligent, clear, rigorously pursued mechanisms to keep you on track to hit performance targets with relentless consistency over time. Relentless consistency is the, the key there. The signature of mediocrity is chronic inconsistency. That's pretty good. Uh, this type of discipline presents two types of discomfort that I find very interesting. Um, first, during difficult times, you have to have unwavering commitment to hit high uh, performance standards. And then when, when conditions go the other way, the economic pendulum swings the other way, you have to kind of restrain yourself in good times to not overextend yourself. And I think back to the, you have to be disciplined, think back to the people thing, we can't grow too fast without getting enough people. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, 
the football term is out kicker coverage. You don't want to kick your coverage. Two little nuggets from BE 2.0, um, smack mindset. Um, there's a mindset and a framework. It's, it's covered in, in great by choice in chapter six. It's, a, it's really, really um, kind of, I think the way to operationalize your 20 mile march is a way to, good way to frame that maybe. Um, I encourage you to read that, especially if you're an operator. This is why I say operations are, are difficult because they have to do this. <laughs> Whereas people, CFOs, you know, do not have to do that as much um, across uh, the organizations. Um, if you cannot control your prices, you must control your costs. <laughs> I think oh, there's, there's a discipline not everybody's learned. Um, Southwest Airlines and Nucor, um, they, their examples from Jim's research in awful industries, airline industry is awful, steel industry, awful, just awful industries to work in, but they produce fantastic results, especially industry adjusted. How? Low cost, not low price. Control of the cost, They're very, very disciplined. They're 20 mile marchers. Southwest seems like a fun company, but it's, it's a 20 mile marcher to the end. Principle number eight, fire bullets and cannibals. This is about empirical creativity. So based on the research, you know, brilliant innovative leaps and big bets, big uncalibrated bets don't produce superior results in the, in the long run. What does produce superior results in the long run? First fire bullets, then fire cannonballs. Uh, so a bullet is defined as a low cost, low risk, low distraction, key, low distraction, can't distract anybody else, test or experiment. You use that to validate what works empirically. Then you take your findings from your, I'd call it disciplined research, your empirically validated uh, test cases. Say, okay, this one works, we're going big on that. Um, this, um, takes a lot of discipline to do because it's easy, to, easy, easy to come up with ideas. Creativity is the easy part. Jim, Jim says it over and over and over. Creativity is the easy part. The ability to scale innovation is really hard. Although being first can confer an initial advantage, building a well-run company that can innovate repeatedly, repeatedly and execute at scale is much more significant and sustainable advantage. Um, think about companies like 3M. You know, it's like you said, they're probably not the most creative company in the world, but they blend creativity with this discipline to scale things. Like, oh, this little piece of paper, this little piece of paper with sticky um, residue can, can work. Oh, people want that? Oh, can we make it for a quarter of a penny? <laughs> Um, so they do it at scale. Creativity is the easy part. Discipline and scale are the hard part. All right, so now we are moving to build to last, build to last. Um, so we've got disciplined people who engage in disciplined thought and engage in disciplined action. Now we're moving to build to last. So how do you survive long-term? It's not if negative events will hit you, it's when, it's when, it's not if, it's when. It's how you prepare for the unexpected that determines whether you survive and thrive long-term. Based on the research, the CEOs were a little bit paranoid, always asking, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then there were three key behaviors that they engaged in. Built huge cash reserves and buffers. The, the companies that, in the research. They bound the risk, catastrophic risk, asymmetrical risk, and control the risk. They, they thought about risk. They, they tried their best to mitigate it. And they were well, and I'm sure they were well insured. And then they engaged in what Jim calls zooming out and zooming in. So let's look what's going on in the industry, zoom out, and then zoom in. How does that impact our company? What's going on in the economy? How does that impact our company? Zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in. 
Always looking back and forth. Keep your head on a swivel like you're a linebacker on a football. Analogy there. How do you practice productive paranoia? Take the five stages of decline test. So um, from How the Mighty Fall, the book How the Mighty Fall, um, Jim outlined the five stages of decline where companies think they're great, hubris born of success. They, in an undisciplined way, pursue more. They read their own, you know, believe their own press, deny the risk of peril. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're growing, growing, growing. All of a sudden they find themselves grasping for salvation in, in, in short order because they weren't disciplined in the way they approach their growth. Um, yeah, that, avoid the five stages of decline. Do that. Clock building, not time telling. Um, so this principle really gets at uh, after a leader leaves, after a leader of a team moves on to a different team, does that team thrive? Does the organization th thrive after the leader is gone? Uh, organizations that engage in clock building, develop all five leaders, organizations that engage in time telling, uh, really embrace charismatic visionaries, like genius with a thousand helpers model, uh, clock building organizations have a culture of discipline and they reinforce their core values very, very diligently. Uh, I'm just taking a look at time here, Devin. I'm gonna I'm gonna move through a little quicker. Uh, clock building example: U.S. Constitution, time telling, the uh, daily news cycle. Preserve the core and simulate progress. This is the the genius of the and showing up again. So you want to preserve your core values, preserve your core purpose, everything else on the table for change. Preserve your core, stimulate progress, stimulate growth. Um, stimulate new ideas, stimulate dialogue and debate, stimulate um, new ways of doing things. Um, don't confuse the way you do things with the core value is, is one of the key uh, things Jim will know. Um, BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals do not equal, not the same thing as small, ball, unaudacious goals. Example there from my favorite Fortune 500 company in the United States, Starbucks. The first attempt, Starbucks went to visit Jim in his lab. They said, we have a BHAG. We, we're going to have 2,000 stores by the year 2000. And um, Jim said, ah, nice try. Why don't you go back to Seattle and think about that for a little more. Challenge them with a bunch of questions. When they came back, their BHAG was to turn Starbucks brand into the most recognized and respected consumer brand in the world, in the world. Position currently held by Coca-Cola. And I think, being a fan, knowing what Starbucks did from the year 2000, when, or 1990, whatever, when they were visiting Jim, till, till now, I think Starbucks has really uh, made a lot of uh, progress on that BHA goal. Return on luck, uh, last, last of the principles here. About 50% of great leadership is what you do with the unexpected. That was maybe one of my favorite Jim Collins quotes there. Uh, luck is asymmetrical. So bad luck can be catastrophic. Good luck can never make you great. But a bout of good luck can never make you great. If you win the lottery, it doesn't make you a great person. Right? No, no, no. Good luck doesn't make you great. So a little um, grid here. He challenges you to think about it in terms of you know, what's your luck? Good, good luck on the right, bad luck on the left. Are you getting a low return on luck or a high return on luck? So in bad luck situations, you want to get a high return on luck. You want to be really prepared for bad luck situations. And those are defining moments for companies that survive and thrive long term. Getting a high return on good luck, that's what you're supposed to do. You should already have the disciplined people who can engage in disciplined thought and take disciplined action to achieve a uh, high return on good luck. And if you get a low return on either of these, you know, a low, low return on good luck is, is the path to mediocrity. Low return on bad luck will really get you. 
what type of luck is the most important? Who luck? Who luck in life is 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 definitely the, the most important. You know, who you hire, who who you surround yourself with. Um, final um, little bonus here: ten x leadership. So in Great by Choice, Jim uh, combined four of the principles together to to really get at okay, if you're a ten x leader, uh, based on the research. Here are the behaviors you engage in. Level five ambition surrounded by fanatic discipline, empirical creativity, and productive memory. Yeah, I see uh, a bunch of questions um, and we are at 8.50, so 10 minutes here, Devin. This is great. Thank you so much, Blake, for the presentation. Super interesting to get this huge overview of Jim Collins' work and his research. That is and, a, a lot to cram into 40 minutes. <laughs> it's a lot, but you I did it. That. And uh, we do have questions. We don't have a ton of time left, but I'd like to at yeah. least get to a couple of them. Yeah. So um, one of the questions that came in uh, relates to one of the last points you had just made. Marty brought this question forward. Blake, how does Mr. Collins reconcile the data, data, data thinking with people being the most important part? Um, Marty sees some conflict there potentially and makes me makes her think of baseball teams like the Minnesota Twins, perhaps, that are supposed oh. to be using analytics. <laughs> I, I don't think the Minnesota apart. Twins are following the analytics there. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, he first they take a look at the data. So the research methodology, they're using matched pair comparisons. And then um, what they do is they do interviews with the executives from both the good to great companies or the, the great by choice companies, the 10X companies and the comparison companies. They, they just, they interview people and they ask, well, what was it? What was it? What was it? What was it? So they, they do the quantitative and qualitative analysis. If you follow, you know, the results are kind of at the end of the road. If you follow upstream all the way, it all starts with people. And that's right. Every good to great transition, if you, Look at the book. Every good to great transition started with a level five leader. Starting, it's the starting point every time. So it's always, it's always if you follow the numbers back upstream, you'll see people. Hmm. That's really interesting. Here's another one too. Someone sent in a note. My friend Lynn actually sent in a note, um, just noting that some of the examples Jim Collins has used in the past about these enduring companies yeah. have not have not endured. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Examples yeah. like Circuit City or, you know, Gillette or Walgreens that have had Wells Fargo that have had all these changes. You yeah. know, do you think that any of these principles have not stood the test of time or how would you comment on those things? Um, I think, I think the principles stand the test of time. I think the companies lose focus and discipline. I, I honestly do. Um, you look at Circuit City, uh, they were a good to great company. Right? They were in the good to great research because they had a level five leader. They engaged in, in discipline thought and discipline action. They got to that point, but they didn't build it to last. They did not engage in productive paranoia. They did, they did not embrace um, the uh, preserve the core and stimulate progress. I mean, they, they, they could have. They could have. I think GE is another example, right? GE is in, in I built to last. Um, just um, they lose their way after a period of time because it takes it, the amount of discipline it takes to keep that together is, is it's like fanatical. It's fanatical discipline to keep that level of performance. Together. Think about, ask that same question. Jim uses this, this as, as an example of the UCLA Bruins dynasty um, under co coach Wooden. Wooden. Yeah. John Wooden. Um, John Wooden co coached at UCLA for 15 years without winning a single championship. Developed a method in that 15 years, won 10 championships in 12 years, right? That's a dynasty. That is great performance. But, you know, he went away. Everybody else replicated his method. Things didn't evolve. You can create a dynasty that doesn't last. Um, and I think the challenge is for, for great performance is how you sustain it. I think, you know, getting, getting to peak great performance, like Walgreens, and Walgreens has a, a, just a fantastic hedgehog concept. Walgreens used to be in, invested in um, restaurants. Walgreens used to run restaurants. Um, they said, we're divesting that. We're just going to drugstores. Here's our model. Drugstore 
on every corner, convenient. They printed money for a long time. Pork Walgreen, their CEO, um, eventually retired, had a good successor, but their run ends um, if you don't keep it going. Thanks for your comments on that. You know, for the sake of time, we want to make sure we give a little bit of lead time to people for their next yeah. engagement. So Blake, I want to say thank you so much for your presentation, for fielding some questions this morning. This was excellent. Um, and I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. You know, our goal with these sessions is to provide really smart topics, practical applications. So hopefully you're able to take away maybe some of those principles from Jim Collins today that you're able to apply to your work. Uh, you know, those qualities of smart and practical are the goal with all of what we do in CAPE, all of our CAPE programming. So if you're looking for additional professional development opportunities, please check out our website for upcoming learning sessions. You know, there's a couple I want to highlight that are coming up in September as we kind of start our fall semester. Um, our popular certified professional project manager or CPPM program begins on September 15th. We've got strategies for effective negotiation, which is a two-day course beginning September 16th. And then Digital Marketing Fundamentals launches on September 20th. So tell your network about our online learning series. Again, you'll get information about our fall series coming up in a future email. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us at the University of St. Thomas this morning. Hope you have a wonderful day. You, Be well. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Blake.